Hello, everybody! Hey. Welcome hey. back to Not... Dungeon of the Mad Mage. I feel like there were like two or three different nuts in there. Welcome back to Dungeon of the Mad Mage. This is session 180. Oh, we're getting closer to that 200 mark, guys. I'm looking yeah. forward to it. We should do something like big. Uh, how? How? What do you mean? How did we get? How are how we did, still? How on did there? we get here? That's a good question. <laughs> like honestly, a good question. But it's been a ride. Um, I don't like. I I I do the YouTube thing every day, right? So like, I get to see comments that people are making all the time, and we've had a couple of people here lately, right? Um, that we've had a couple of people here lately that have been watching the YouTube uh videos, like catching up on Dungeon the Mad Mage and things like that. And it's been kind of wild watching them comment on things from like two or three years ago and then like have that memory brought back up um, and be like, oh shit, that actually happened. Oh fuck, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, right? So um, I, uh, looking back, it's actually been a bit of a wild ride. Anyways, let's go ahead and kick tonight's session off. With a little bit of a recap, shall we? No, let's say we did. Let's not say we did. Okay, uh, we said we did. Let's move on. No, okay. I, I actually, I actually have to do these for the recap series now, Zach. You, I can't just, I can't just skip. <laughs> it's a thing. <laughs> All right. Previously, on the dungeon of the Mad Mage, in the periphery of the region of dreams. Alcor. The party had been separated, each flung into their own dream, floating through the demiplane, tethered only by their own subconscious. But MS Laria, their dream guide, was slowly but surely finding them, and binding their consciousness to hers, then ferrying them onward. The moon elf had already found Ezra, experiencing the tumultuous storms of the sorcerers elemental oh, nightmares, wow. as well as Ashes, oh, wow. who she witnessed reliving a failure of his past turned briefly, perhaps bittersweetly, into a victory within the dream. Now Amos Laria had found shade in the graveyard. The tabaxi's hunter's dream was still in flux, a space from his memories, the edges of the jungles of Maztica, but not an actual memory itself. A fantasy. A possibility. A chance to be something else. Something more. Bones' mind had hatched a plot for his old tribe to make himself renowned. But it wasn't where the bone carver's heart was, and so the dream shifted, replacing his old tribe with his new one. The Skull Takers. And there was a new skull to be taken. It was a simple plan. Hunt a young dragon turtle. Stealth, strength, cunning, timing. It needed all of those. And it worked. Mostly. Though the dream did fight them a bit. But for the most part, it worked. Blarg grabbed the dragon turtle's tail, groin stunned it with a heavy blow to the head, and Pibble and Bones cut the creature's head off. But the thing began to sink into the aqueducts beneath it. They were going to lose it. They had won, but still they were going to lose. And then a dragon roared overhead, and the dream shivered. The melty terrain sagged under the weight of the flexing dreamscape. Warden Dragger had come, a figure from Bones' past, a thorn in the side of his old tribe, now presenting itself as a complication. I lost my place. My eyes failed me. I apologize for the moment. <laughs> Sometimes it happens. Uh... Sometimes it would be that way. Presenting himself as a complication. For whatever reason, over and over again, threats kept coming for the Skulltakers. The dragon snatched the turtle up, 
heaving it on land, preventing it from sinking beneath the water. But the Skull Takers would not give up their trophy without a fight. They attacked the Black Dragon in earnest. But its claws and fangs, its tail and acid, they were all as death. Bones took blow after blow, each time a spectral Skull Taker stepping in front of him to take some of the damage. Each time they were obliterated. Each time something was lost in the Tabaxi's heart. But still, they fought. Groin was a fury that faded fast, diminished by the acid breath of Warden Dragger. Blarg fought on, pressing the beast, but was unable to force its focus. The battle grew desperate for both the sides, the dragon firing a cloud of acid rain into the air. It focused on bones now, the dream at the helm, steering the dragon's eyes, trying to put down the dreamer that sought to master it. The rogue gambled. Streaking into the rain, his fur burning beneath its acid, to deliver a hefty blow. A non-fatal hefty blow. The dragon turned on him, claws and fangs scoring through him, rending his vitality from the dream. But Bones was not alone. The point of a tribe was so that you didn't have to struggle alone. Pibble rushed into the acid rain to aid the boss. Rip the serrated short sword he had made from the Queen of Bones' mandible, cutting into, then through, Warden Dragger. Who promptly popped like a balloon, because it's a dream after all. The dream diminished, faded. Amislaria had bound Bones, the tabaxi had succeeded. In more ways than one, perhaps. Because the strangeness of his dream had been contested by a dark presence before it had started, a looming serpentine threat in his mind. But during the dream, just for the briefest moment, it had bent to his will, and he'd reached in and touched the heart of Warden Dragger. Who knew what that would mean in the end? But for now, the trio moved guided closer to the center of Dalkor, toward their waiting ally, the Tashtai. One last dream before they breached the center, before the search for Valena began in earnest. And that's where we fade into our scene. Well, that's where we fade to black. Are we going to get back to the school takers and they're all going to be comatose from dying the dream realm every single fucking one of them is fucked i'm gonna become batman <laughs> <laughs> i feel like you're already you on batman. that edge batman batman very nice mm. um there's a moment um ezra ashes bones you feel yourselves your collective consciousness together, bound to the dreamer, to, to your guide, the moon elf, um, worshipper of Sehanin Boon, Moonbow, Amos Laria. She is guiding you further into this dreamscape. And as you're kind of like traveling, uh, uh, unlike the the you know, kind of like interior of your dreams where it's darkness and then scene, darkness and then scene. It's like you're... It's like you're driving through a dark, rainy city. Um, But uh, your vision's blurred, right? Like, the, the windshield wipers don't work. All you see are these kind of like globes of like smeared bright lights that just streak past you. Different hues, different colors, reds, greens, blues, purples, um, all different colors, um, and all different vibrancies. Um, some of them flickering, some of them flashing brightly as you pass. Um, you know instinctually that these are dreams, and you can see them 
nestled, not in a singular plane as as if you you would see if you were driving in in a city, right? But all around you, right? Primarily in a almost kind of like horizontal plane, but with a corona, kind of like a a, a, a less populated, a less densely populated top and bottom, kind of like as you're moving through it, right? Um, vibrant colors, small dreams, large dreams, and you see flashes, silhouettes in them as you're kind of like passing near them, but only for these brief, brief moments. However, there is a, a somewhat indeterminable amount of time that passes where Amos Laria is focused on finding Matashtai. She she seems to know where she is going, right? She has like a bead on her quarry, but it's just taking a while to get there. Um, and each of you is like this consciousness piggybacking on her own, but you're adjacent enough to, to almost be as if you're standing next to each other on a tram, or bus, or the middle of the street. Um, do you do anything? Do you say anything? Do you talk? Do you discuss? W am I also there? No, you're going? not there. You you gone. Okay. You solo. You solo lonely boy. Okay. Gotcha. Um, Fucking aliens. So, is so that like is that the actual or... communication? That wasn't a Jake statement. That was an Ezra statement. Just like no, that was that was a Jake okay, statement. Okay, that was I was questioning. It was a Jake statement. No, I I think Ezra would kind of be muttering under his breath, just trying to take everything in and interpret what this all means. Oh man, guys, I had a great time. Did you guys have a good time? Yo, dreams we... are fucking cool. I mean, do we remember like you have, so, do we so remember you have other dreams you have vivid memories specifically of the scenes we witnessed and actually of no others right so whether you dreamed of anything else prior to this right um is uncertain right because like Amos Laria took a while to find ashes and bones but Ashes and Bones, you just remember darkness prior to the dream that you experienced. So, so, so but we only remember our own dream. We don't remember each You do not remember correct? the other person's dreams, no. Yes. You weren't a part. You were, um, um, what was happening with each one of you, specifically Ezra during Ashes and Ezra and Ashes during Bones, is Amos Laria would kind of guide you to this place and she'd tell you, hey, I found so-and-so. And then... You were just kind of like there, just kind of like hanging right. in nothingness, seeing Waiting. this yep. light, right? Um, and then you kind of get tethered. Like, it's basically like Amos Laria puts your leash around a, a metaphorical yep. post or drops yep. your anchor, that type While of thing. While she goes grocery because, shopping. Yeah, because she's got to go yep. in to like bind the the person that she's uh, working right. with. Um, whereas if she were to try to bring you into the dream, um, yes. it would mean two dreamers and the yep. dream having a shit bit, right? Yep. So, so no, you do not just, rem just, remember just any, from it. Yeah. yeah. You don't remember each other's dreams. You just remember your own dream. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't say anything. You don't share anything that. about no. your dream? <laughs> not, not fucking bunnies. Okay. So Bones pipes up and kind of like, you know. Uh, talks about how he, his his was really cool, or he really enjoyed his. Um, Ezra stays quiet um, throughout the exchange, kind of like... I mean, I don't think Ezra's the... Ezra's capable of lying or throwing an act, but I don't think he's trying to right now. He's just not talking about the thing. He's just distracted. Yeah, right? Or, or at least feigning distraction. Sure. Uh, well, mine, I, I just kind of relived my past. At least part of it. Yo, that's cool. Was it fun? In a way, yeah. Neat. 
What about you, Ezra? What you dream? Uh, what? What? Th that's cool. Did you see that? That's that's. Whoa. There's this uh, there's this massive like golden dream light that you're passing, and there's like some massive bodied thing that has this huge neck that just goes up and up and up and up mm -hmm. and up and up. Is it Brams? Mm, we call those giraffe. I don't know if you guys have Giraffe. ever seen them. It has I a love, soft beak. I love that. I, I fucking hate that, and I love that. <laughs> oh. There's a there's a moment that passes, um, or there's several moments that passes pass mm -hmm. right. Um, there's a like I said a. It's hard to judge time here. You find yourselves, your train of thought lost very easily. Um, I know you said you were feigning kind of like distraction, Ezra, but it actually is extremely easy to kind of like drift off. And you, every once in a while, you feel this kind of like tug on your consciousness. And you realize, all of you, this happens to all of you, you realize it's Amis Laria, right? She's kind of like tugging you back in line right like as your consciousness yep. starts to try to drift off and go back into a dream like you you try to like build bud your own light out and create your own dream again uh Anna Slaria just kind of kind of has like you on a tight leash and she's just like ah nope yoink he jerks you back in um oh man I wonder what it would be like to fight a gold dragon you say that out loud yeah, and then I start thinking about it heavily. Uh, I need all... I need bones to roll. You know what? It's not a roll. It's not a roll. She's got you. That's bones rapidly begins to drift away. <laughs> and Ezra and Ashes, you you, you can see um, his, a light Bye. around Bones' consciousness Bye. begins to blossom. This golden light begins to blossom around him very rapidly. Um, and... You hear Amos Laria in all your minds. Cut that out. And the light just gets swallowed real quick. And his light just gets yoinked back to the group. Um, and, but un, un, kind of like, you know, subconsciously or, or, or without your real control being a part of it, both Ezra and Ashes, you also, it's like saying, don't think of pink elephants, right? So Bones is like, <laughs> you know, wouldn't it be cool to fight a gold dragon? And both of you are like, gold dragon, wait, what? Right? And just the mere thought does start to spark a little bit of something. And Amos Loria tugs on both of you as well. Not, not as sharply it's... as Bones, but it's definitely one of those like pulling the the dogs that are trying to like go sniff something is like no 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 we're going this direction right type of situation jeremy, jeremy i've got ptsd from puppy sitting like why are you doing this to me <laughs> i've only i've only dog walked multiple dogs once in my life and i never want to do it again ever and they weren't even especially big dogs it was just a hellacious hellscape of like let's go in different directions Oh, let's go in the same direction unexpectedly at the same time. <laughs> Fuck. Anyways. Amos Laria uh, chides you all, especially you, Bones. Uh, and and she, you hear her in your mind. You just, Keep control of yourself. This is already hard enough as is. Sorry. You don't sound very sorry. I'm not. Uh, you, <laughs> if you could hear eye rolling, you <laughs> would hear eye rolling in this dreamscape, right? A, a little bit more time passes. Um, and it's, again, it's, it's all but impossible to not allow your mind to wonder. It is the realm of dreams. It's partially what it's designed to do. Um, you feel a couple more tugs throughout as Anna Slaria kind of like keeps you, her, her wayward, um, wards kind of like guided in the right direction. Uh, and a few... Moments later, you all hear in your minds, you hear, We're here. 
and you find yourself before a massive light. Matashtai, what color is that light? Muted. Oh, it's muted. Damn. It's a That's muted sad. light. Muted light. Sorry, say that one more time. What color light is what? What color is the light of your dream? What hue? Orange. Has Matashtai an orange boy, or is he just having orange dreams tonight? Orange, orange black dreams. Me? Oh, shit. <laughs> there is a towering light before Ezra, Ashes, and Bones. A towering light of a faintly orange hue and silhouetted in the darkness of this dream is mountains. A mountainscape. As if you are viewing a mountain range from a far off distance. Jagged, broken peaks. It's huge. It is by far the biggest dream that you have seen on your brief journey in this place. Size doesn't matter. It's how you use it. <laughs> oh, God damn it. It is somewhat intimidating. Just being next to this thing. It's almost like a a, a noir film, kind of like with orange, kind of like sepia tone over it. Um, and it... It has a... It has a resonance about it. There's like a, a humming that seems to be coming off of the dream. And it kind of like, it hits each one of you in your core and it kind of vibrates through you. And after a few moments of this, you feel your whole body kind of shaking. And then it stops. As the vibrations in your consciousness come to match the resonance of Matashtai's dream. Emma Solaria speaks into your minds and she says, Okay. I need... This is gonna be... tough. I need you three... Hey! Pay attention! Bones! Yeah, what? Stop wandering yeah. off! I'm here. I'm on present. I need you three. I'm going to leave you untethered. Because this is a big dream. And I need you to make sure nothing comes in after me. Are you sure you can't tether us? Him? Us? Oh. Do you want to be tethered together? I can I can keep you guys tethered together. Yeah. I don't know if that's a good what idea. Could possibly go wrong. Nushing. Look. This is a very big dream. It's got a lot of I don't know, energy in it, and we're very near the edge of where where I'd say we'd be breaching the boundary of being in the dream realm and then actually being in Dalcor. Which means we're probably very close to bad stuff maybe coming out and seeing how things are going. So I don't want to just bind you to this place and I might need your aid. Okay, right, so, uh, I think really hard about having a body. Let, let's just uh, be clear of what you want from us. Like, 
like sh things might come to us and we're supposed to kill it. Is that that? Things might. Okay, she. It's it's kind of weird because it's nebulous, right? Like you all, all four of you are these kind of like you three actually are these smaller lights, these little like blips of consciousness, right? Not dreams themselves, just actual consciousness. Um, and then there's this bigger blip that is Amislaria, right? So it's like these three three little circles, slightly bigger circle, following through this murky darkness, surrounded like big by big colored circles, and it's like. You you are marbles that have been passing by oranges and basketballs and things like that, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. She has brought you up to this immense orange globe that in you cannot see around. It is so big, right? So it's like it's like comparing. You know, you've been passing by oranges and basketballs, and this is like an apartment complex. Oh, sweet. And so she basically is like gesturing, or 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 she's not really like pointing because she doesn't have arms. She's a little <laughs> dream ball, right? But she is, you know, giving you this kind of like insinuation of like, you see all of this space, right? All that you can see of this orangeness. If anything, if any other lights like the size of us, right? Come to this thing and try to go into it. Stop them. And if you can't the stop entrance? them, what? Is this the only entrance right here? Entrances are kind of like, they're not real here. What you see right now is just kind of like a, your subconsciousness is, interpretation of the size and scope of this dream right but really it's just a pinpoint impression so if something is on the other side quote unquote other side trying to get in you're still going to see it here okay that's what I needed to, good alright cool the bounce it's like it's like a different dimension She's she's talking on a different dimensional scale Right, mm -hmm. is like the things just don't make sense from just a 3D. Oh, no, she's, she's talking in in 4D. Yeah. And so, she she's basically asking you guys if if you and and there's a risk, right? Like she she's telling you straight out, there is a risk in her not tethering you. And giving you a little bit of, like, leash, giving you a little bit of free reign, right, to try to help. Because it could mean that you could help, it also could mean that you could hurt, or it could mean that you get lost in the dream and you're bye-bye. It's fine, I won't get lost again. Unless there's a cool dragon. And she, she basically puts it to you guys. What do you want to do? I, I, it sounds like Bones. I know what Bones wants to do, you know. No, no. I mean, I, I'll if that's what she wants to do, then I'm yeah. I'll 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 do my best. Ezra. Okay. Don't rick me. Stop. You gonna? Do you? Do sorry, you want, I can't help myself. Do you want to be tethered together? Would that? Would that increase the difficulty of us providing aid? It will potentially increase the difficulty of you providing aid because you'll have to move as a unit, but it will also drastically decrease the chances of one of you getting lost and fading into a dream. Hmm, some good old fashioned risk versus reward. Basically. No, I don't think we I don't think we need to be tethered. I think it's fine. I love okay. Zach's confidence. That's so double may care. It it's such unwarranted confidence, but I love it. <laughs> I care. Oh yeah, absolutely. Devil may care okay. is not the same thing as not caring. Right? In fact, Devil May Care is almost kind of like in the opposite direction of like, I am going to oh, so over the top not care 
But actually, I really care. Anyways. Okay. No uh, tether. Amos Laria does not tether you. And she leaves you with the instructions, again, that if you see any lights, try to invade this dream. Try to come into the dream after her, right? That you try to stop it. And then she leaves. She doesn't give you any real instructions on how you're supposed to stop it. <laughs> the dream she, just, power. she just leaves. Star power. You mm -hmm. see, you see this larger, slightly kind of like a teal-ish light um, move into mm -hmm. the orange, press into it, and then is swallowed by the orange, um, disappearing. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. <laughs> Music change. Matashta. Hello. Oh, Matashta. How old is Matashta? Seven. Seven. Twenty-eight. Damn. No sevens. 728. 28? Hey, hold on. Let me double check. Ah. How long has Matashtai been with the Presidium? Uh, since he was 18. Ooh. Is that because it was like a... We won't let you join the Presidium until you're of age type thing? His parents wouldn't let him go be a child soldier. Ah, oh, gotcha. So the Presidium will let you be a child soldier, but your parents wouldn't. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Understood. Fair. Okay. Huh? He, had to, he had to help on the farm before he could go. Oh, shit. My walls just shook from the thunder that is rolling wow. outside. So, first of all, Jay, it, incoming. Um, yep, incoming. Uh, second of all, if if my power goes out, if the stream drops, that's why. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll try to we'll try to work it out. <laughs> so, the cash tie. Twenty eight years old. Off to join the Presidium at eighteen. How did that work? Did you have to? Were you able to just like immediately like okay, I'm I'm a part of the Presidium. Now I pick the hearth guard and I'm immediately a part of it? Or was it like training for a few years and then joining a branch of the Presidium or what? Sorting it's kind hat. of like you go through basic training and then you get sorted to the order that fits you the most. So uh, it's like that one show with the uh with the woman who was in the teenage sex scandal show. What, what am I thinking about? There's, that's so fucking vague. I have no fucking clue, dude. Um, no fucking idea. It's not limitless. It's it's not Harry Potter. It's uh Hunger Games. No, it's not Hunger Games, but it came out <laughs> in the same time period. Percy oh. Jackson. No. Movie Go. with girl who Go. got teenage preg. Nan. Juno? It's not Juno. Good. Um, Good luck. Good luck with the googling. Anyways, moving on. Um. Uh. So it's a little, little bit of basic, and then, do you have, do you have a large like control on where you're going, or do they just tell you you're gonna join X faction of the Presidium? It's like a. Uh... This is what we think you'd be best at. How do you feel about that? Gotcha. And if you want to be in something else, then you have to prove that you can do it. So, yeah, if you're truly obstinate, we don't just let you be like, no, I want this. And then we're like, fine, you can have this. If you're truly like, obstinate, then you can magic, prove yourself. I'm not going to be Horizon Walker. Fair enough, <laughs> right? Divergent. It's, this is exactly the plot of Divergent. 
Divergent. Gotcha. I actually have oh, yes, heard of exactly Divergent. The plot. Exactly, exactly the plot. Identical plot. Identical. From what, from what I've seen of the movies, this is exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, Good. Dreamscape. Good Perfect. to know. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. Matashtai. That means you've been a part of the Hearthguard for the better part of 10 years, right? You know, yeah. nine, nine, eight, nine, ten 10 years, somewhere in there, right? Like, um, obviously, actually, I guess technically, the last six months or so has been on Faerun or in space travel or in preparation to go do space travel, right? The journey um, with your master Liu Soon and your your friend Darren Tash to um undertake undertake a quest to become a champion of Boldre. I I we're doing this on the fly by the way. I'm I'm going to ask you legitimately like straight up. What the fuck prompted that? Like you're you're in the Hearthguard for close to a decade and then all of a sudden you go to a different world on a quest to become a champion of a goddess that you believe in but aren't especially devout towards yep what, what prompted that <laughs> why did why did that happen uh the the war with reedrin has been ramping up in the last few years and adar is starting to lose more and more ground uh, mm. to the point where they are growing desperate. Um, and they've sent other people to try and find these artifacts, but they haven't returned. So Matt's not the first one to try this. And if I remember correctly, it's not just one set of artifacts, right? Like there are multiple different sets yeah. of there's, artifacts. There's a like set for each of the orders. So, so it's not like but Matt. Not all of them are unfairing. Ah, yeah, right, right, absolutely. So it, it's not a scenario of like Matt undertakes a quest to become the sole savior of his people. It's many people are on quests to try to become these figures that can hopefully turn the tide against what is happening in their homeland. In, in a perfect world, the Presidium would be able to bring forth five champions of the five orders i swear to god sweet artifacts i swear to god if it's water fire wind <laughs> or <No>. hard <laughs> i'm gonna, I'm gonna lose my shit over here or, by no, their no, powers her, combined her, her. they they summon captain eberron have we ever have, have we ever said what the five orders are uh yeah i, I know what the five orders are absolutely i don't, I don't know that we've discussed them like in depth in 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 show gotcha oh for context it is the hearth guards the quill blades the horizon walkers the wayfinders and the oath finders we have okay. fucking yeah. on <laughs> which also for clarity and this is not meant in any way shape form or fashion but i think it is in it is not meant derogatory but i think it is incredibly apropos for matashtai but the hearth guard are basically the we're gonna bash your oh, faces they're like, in <laughs> they're just the yeah, they're, they're just like, the front like soldiers the we're gonna, commandos yeah we're gonna yeah. we're gonna fight we're just gonna fight everyone else is doing this specialized shit we're the yeah. we're on like, the we're gonna fight team <laughs> Yeah, like um, quill blades. Think of them as like nerdy assassins. They sure. like disguise themselves as like librarians and like nerdy paper pushers and then mm -hmm. murder people. Fair amount of like uh, magic mixed in, like gish, gish assassins yeah. type scenario, right? Like um, horizon walkers are the main magical order, sure. um, which they focus mostly on teleportation magic. Because and, that's how they travel the um, Adara mountain range quickly to combat Riedrin. And one of the only reasons Riedra. why why Riedra 
is actually held at bay is by the fact that the Horizon Walkers, anytime the forces of the Unity push against Adar, the Horizon Walkers make sure that the Presidium is there. Yeah. You know? Um, Wayfinders are like your typical scouting, rangers, hmm. moving through the forest kind of thing. And then the Oathbinders are uh, ambassadors, diplomacy. Which for clarity, circling back to the Wayfinders, right? Because I'm just, as a as a ranger by heart, I feel a little diminished by that description, right? But well, keep it's just, in it's, mind, it's more basic wow. yeah. Adar is a mountain range, so they are Wayfinders of like the Himalayas, basically, <laughs> right? Like they ain't they ain't fucking around. And then Oathbinders, like I said, are like the diplomats, ambassadors, uh, bards, very charismatic people yeah. trying to gain allies for a daughter. Yeah. Which unfortunately are pretty few and far between. Not not yeah. that there aren't, you know, people that that hearken to the plight of Adar. Um, it's just unfortunately the the unity one, Eberron is made up of several different continents. Many of them, I would say, are significantly smaller than the, the massive continent than Faerun, right? Than the massive continent that it, it makes up a goodly portion of, of Toril, right? Um, like, many of the places in Eberron are the size, are continents the size of the Sword Coast, Right? Um, so you have these encapsulated conflicts and different, like, climates, political climates, and, and different situations going on there, right? Um, so it can actually be somewhat difficult for other people to get really involved. And the, the Unity, or Riedra, right, um, kind of fucked up a lot of its competition on the continent very quickly. Um, so there's only a few holdouts other than Adar on... isn't. Isn't it like Sarlona or something like that? Is the continent that um, yeah, I think that Sarlona is the name of the actual continent. Yeah. So, anyways, little little backstory history scenario there, right? Matashtai. It's good to it's good to know that you're on this entire journey, not on a whim. Obviously, not a whim, but it does feel somewhat kind of like a. A, I think you use the word right, like not quite there, but a little desperate, right? A yeah. little bit of desperation in this kind of concept of like, look, if we send them out right now, 20, 30, 40 people, right, that we send on these different quests, they're not going to make the difference at this moment. But if even five of them come back as the champions of their orders, those five could make the difference of hundreds, if not thousands. That's a hell of a gamble. Yep. Let's roll some dice, boys. <laughs> that, we've basically been doing that for... for Three and a half years now, it's rolling the dice of does Matashtai return to Eberron as a champion of his order or does he not? Right? Like that's we've been we've been rolling that for a while. I I not that not that it's gonna happen or anything like that, but in the back of my mind, I've always had this concept of like, what the fuck happens if the party actually succeeds in Dungeon of the Mad Mage and Matashtai lives, right? Because if he lives and everyone else doesn't die, <laughs> he's going to have this, this party of 20th level adventurers that are staunch friends and allies that have gone through hell together, right? N no longer with a goal. <laughs> and I'm like... Level 20 short shot to take down the Reedron Empire. Unleash! I've got a tavern to run. What are you talking that's about? That's true. That's um... true. He's got a tavern to run. He's just going to retire. Um, you guys get to play as the four other champions. Yeah, there we go. Oh, oh, like that it. would be wild, like actually. It. That would be kind of cool. That's a good idea. Damn. Let's, let's add another one shot to Jeremy's list <laughs> yeah. of look, one shots. To look, I'm not going to complain. 28. 
18 sent on a mission of desperation. But your story has gone on longer than that, Matashta. When... How old were you when you first met Valena? Oh, we're gonna double check. Pretty young. I wanna say like 10? Uh, about 12, sorry. 12. 12, still pretty young, yeah. Yeah. Getting at that age, right? A 12 year old is, you know, early teenager starting to you know go through hormonal changes that means a lot of different things that means a growing awareness a growing intelligence um of a world larger than the small encapsulated place that you call home right um because that that doesn't really become a thing until you actually start to be eight nine ten etc etc right um and I think in the world of Adar, right, like a 12-year-old, hell, even in, in the in Faerun, in Toril, right, a 12-year-old is a much different lifestyle than a 12-year-old in our time, right? A 12-year-old in, in the modern era is going to school regularly, has whatever family life they have, lives in whatever country, political climate, etc., etc., but typically speaking... It's a stable-ish life, right? Meals provided for you, education provided for you, a roof over your head, etc., etc. That's not that's not a guarantee in a more medieval fantasy society like Toril, Faerun, the Sword Coast, drilling that down, or Eberron, Sarlona, Adar. But Matashta, you actually did come from a a loving, caring home. Small mountain village. Um, as yet a location undisclosed <laughs> somewhere <laughs> in the Adar Mountains. Uh we'll we'll identify that in the future if it matters, but for now it does not. Remote enough from any of the major cities, right? That your presence is relatively inconsequential, right? But also, generally speaking, remote enough that your presence is inconsequential, which means not a lot of reason for you to be targeted by Adar, not on the border, not, not a viable threat or target, not a strategic point. A quiet life. In, in a mountainous landscape, which surprisingly can support quite a bit of farmland, actually. I did not know this until I started researching how, <laughs> how do mountainous societies live in a medieval environment. And guess what, motherfuckers? In the Alps, they just fucking farm all over the place. It's just a shorter time period in which they get to do it, basically. Um, but yeah, uh, it's kind of wild. There's, it's different interpretations, different people would call it a somewhat idyllic lifestyle, a down to earth, homey environment, a simple house, a loving family, a mother, a father, a younger sister, and chores a lot of chores <laughs> pretty much chores. day in and day out a fair amount of schooling especially i think considering the atmosphere or the era i think adarans probably value an education significantly more than perhaps other contemporaries might in other locations if only honestly for the fact that Knowledge it is important to them because it means opportunities and it means their continued resistance of the Readrian Empire, right? 
Um, without new blood moving, really it's the Presidium, right? Without new blood moving into the Presidium, without the people continuing to believe in the Presidium, then Adar would not, would not exist for many generations. It encourages the people to lead more organized or disciplined lives than other medieval societies might otherwise lead. It leads them to value teaching their children good values, honesty, hope, integrity, hard work, and educating them. Matashtai, though he joined the Earth Guard, I do not think we would describe as a unintelligent individual. I mean, he's kind of a dumb dumb. <laughs> he's not a dumb dumb. He's just, you know, he's not really. He's not book smart. He's not big into the book learning. Exactly right. He's one of those. He's one of those people of your mom. Uh, probably would have been trying to get you to do your lessons and you were like, oh, but I need to go do this chore that dad told me to do, you know? Right? Yeah. Like, always, if the opportunity is presented to him, taking the physical labor route rather than the mental learning route, you know? Yep. Yeah. Very contrary, I think, to the concept of... Valina or Valina's personality. Valina, a somewhat big sister style uh, mentality, who who really values like the psychological depth and understanding of a complex individual, a person who wants to do right and morally understands the conflict that right can entail, that good is not always right and right is not always good, and being able to battle with that moral quandary, but always also being able to... Let's just say it this way. I think Valena strikes me as the person that more often might be bound to an oath binder than a hearth guard <laughs> truth be told <laughs> right yeah but things happen sometimes we do not choose sometimes often you guys didn't often we do not choose the people that are the companions of our lives often they are thrust upon us and we make do with the situations. And sometimes that means that we have conflict in our lives and we are unhappy because of the people that we have to share our lives with. And at other times it creates a synchronicity or in other words, a resonance. I think Valena and Matashtai definitely share a resonance, though the two of them do hold somewhat different values on the occasions, or at least Valena being a being of pure thought and emotion, a being of morality is at times unable to come to grips with what you, a, a being of the flesh, of pain and hunger, has to deal with, right? There are decisions that you have had to make in the 16 years. More years with Valena than you've spent without, actually. At this point, yeah. That's that's a long time to not only know someone, but to have them be a part of your being, to be in your head. I say as never having had anyone in my head. Maybe it's not a long time at all. Who knows? <laughs> it strikes me as a long time. The 
attach time. You are surrounded by darkness for a long time. A concerningly long time. You you know you're supposed to be last on the list. MS Laria told you that. But it feels like it's been weeks. Ooh, it's a long time. It has been weeks. You hear something. It's the first change since you've been, since you've been brought to this darkness. You hear this slight whooshing sound. It takes you a moment to recognize it. Or you realize it's the wind rushing through the fields of grain outside of your little farmhouse. Say it little farmhouse it's a respectable farmhouse it's actually a, nice house. a lot a lot better it's a it's a nice little house it's a lot better than plenty of your neighbors that's not My a competition great, great granddad built that house and your grandfather and your father have made just additions improvements your mother your great grandmother Actually, I want to say, built on the shed in the back. Um, yeah, she had to keep her gardening tools. Yeah. You actually tend relatively large fields. Most of the actual inhabitants of the nearby village, nearby being several miles away, nearby village and the surrounding farmers of this particular mountain um, most of them are farmers, right? Are are tending decently large fields. It is a handful of mountainsides like these that basically support the majority of the entirety of Adar. Fields of golden grain on on mountainsides. It's beautiful. From a distance, it kind of all melds together and it gives the mountainsides this orange hue. You've spent 12 long years here. I say that. Because I imagine a young teenage boy wants to do more, wants to get out and see the world, but I don't actually know that for sure. Was Matashtai content as a 12-year-old? Content, happy, with no no dreams of grandeur, nothing beyond wanting to, to work in the fields of his family? or He wasn't like, oh my god, I gotta get out of here. But there's but definitely he, a longing to do something else. There's always a scenario of when I'm old enough, mm -hmm. then I'll do something. The, the wanderlust didn't truly strike until he first saw the Earth Guard arrive at his village. You see flashes, Matashtai. You and your father working in the fields. Your mother making small, intricate um, weavings, both for your family and to sell at the nearby village. Your younger sister being a nuisance, honestly, pretty pretty much yeah, obviously. straight up, right? <laughs> like, 
She's not always a nuisance, but she's a nuisance a lot of the time. She, do she doesn't have a lot else going on at the moment. She's a little too young to really be doing a lot as far as, like, helpful yard work or farm work or things like that. She helps in chores around the house. She's She doesn't begrudge those things. But she, like you, isn't exactly fond of your mother's lessons. Would rather be out doing things. And in that case, idle hands tends to lead to mischief as as it is wont to. You and her go back and forth on who is at fault in any given situation of getting one another back for countless infractions. Um, over the years. But it's it's a healthy, friendly, sibling rivalry. A, a, a loving, teasing relationship. Which is good, because otherwise you'd kill each other, because you do share a room, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. Yet another reason to be excited about getting old enough to get out. <laughs> yeah. Because this... Uh, you know, room. Yeah, right? Like, this this house, you, I, I imagine Matashtai has probably done several of the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sleep in the shed kind of nights. But up on the fucking mountainside, depending on the time of year, that is a bad oh. idea. <laughs> Especially at night. Then again, your family's large den, family area, living room, whatever you want to call it. The multiple chairs, the small lounges, the great fireplace. You try not to burn too much wood. It's kind of a pain in the ass. There's nearby forests, but they the village tries to keep anyone from cutting too much down to to kind of like stripping the forest or anything like that. So everyone only tries to take so much per year, per cycle. Which means, you know, as fall starts to come, a couple of nights where your dad's kind of like modern equivalent of like, don't touch that thermostat, right? Like, don't you put any logs on that fire. <laughs> it's not cold enough yet for that, right? Until it's, until it's to the point to where your mom's like, all right. The water outside has frozen. Start the damn fire. Right? Like that type of scenario. But in that case, when that happens, oof, those are easy nights to get away. Easy nights to feign that you're going to stay up late, maybe reading or working on something. Your parents are pretty, pretty accepting of that. As long as you are... As long as you, you're doing your chores on the next day, which is most of the time, then they try not to grumble too much about those types of things. Falling asleep on the couch in your living room. Listening to the sounds of that kind of like dying, crackling fire is somewhat nostalgic. But it wasn't one of those nights. Well. Semi sorta. There was a fire. But your parents were less accepting. Perhaps you'd done something, or perhaps they were just thinking of the future. It was an early night. Or at least it was supposed to be an early night. When you were gone to bed. You and your sister both. But... She was a little whiny. You should have told her no. You're supposed to tell her no. When she makes up excuses. You're the older child after all. 
but you didn't care. What does it matter? He was thirsty. He wanted to go downstairs, get a drink of water. Fine. Go. Why are you bugging me? And so she did. She left. Walked out the door, closing it behind her. Her small feet padding down the stairs. Out of earshot. About a minute and a half later, you heard a window shatter. Your mother scream. Another window shatters. And suddenly, there's a large figure in your room. A sinister man, long, thick, tousled beard, covered in grime, grit, toothy grin, and a rusty scimitar in his hand. He sh jumped through your window, shattered the window pane itself. And time seems to stand still. You bolt upright in your bed. And you see sinister malice in the eyes of this man. He seems to look you in the eye for a brief moment. And I don't know if Matashtai actually remembers this or if this is a feigned memory, the, the kind that dreams play on one's mind. But there's a moment where this man looks into the eyes of this child, knowing that he is going to slit him from stem to stern. And enjoy it. That he's going to take a sick amount of pleasure in ending this young boy's life. The door is thrown open to your room. And immediately afterwards, your head turning, trying to see who else, what other strange hostile creature has rushed into your chamber... Instead, as your head is turning, you see a chair hurtling through the air, slamming into the, the individual that has shattered through your window and slamming him back into the, the wall. Instinctually, you roll off the bed towards the doorway and you see your father, Dal, standing there. having just thrown a chair at this attacker that has barged into your home. He looks at you. He looks at your sister's empty bed. Two words. Your sister. You don't even get to respond. He sees it on your face. Find her. Hide. And then he charges at the man who is still recovering from having this chair thrown and shattered upon him. And you, a good Adaran child, disciplined for the most part, and frightened as hell, rush out of the chamber, down the hallway, down the stairs knowing that you have to find your sister the dream blinks darkness 
you rush into a kitchen. Throw the door open wide. It's just one of those swing doors. No, no latch or handle or anything like that. And immediately you're struck by the warmth of the room. Dying coals still under a large pot. A cauldron that hangs on the left side of the room. Massive table. Um, mostly cleaned off from the work that your mother has done. Speaking of which, you hear a scream at your back through the dining room and into the study the second time that you've heard your mother scream in the last 30 seconds this one sounds less of surprise and more of anger you rush into the kitchen you look around you don't see your sister. You move further into the L-shaped room. Perhaps she's in the pantry. The one of the cabinets peeked open ever so slightly. A young eye, a little face peeking out. A gasp. Your sister. And as soon as he goes to open the cupboard door, you hear <laughs> as the outer door to the kitchen is kicked in. And barging into the kitchen behind you is another ruffian. Another stark figure. You can see better in the light, the low light of the kitchen, than you could in your room. This figure is covered in ill-kept leathers. Grimy. It's a it's a bandit. It's... It's a bandit. These men... Are attacking your home. They're, they're gonna kill you and your family. They're going to kill you just for the sake of taking your stuff. You hear in the distance this... Dung 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 The bell in the village is ringing. The bell in the village is ringing. Help will come to the village. But you're a long way from the village. Your sister closes the cupboard. Jerks it shut. Whether by instinct or perhaps you motion for her to do so. But it's too late. The bandit. The ruffian. The, the man who's going to murder you both has seen it. Sees a 12-year-old boy in front of him. The Tashtai, knowing of no other recourse, looks to his left. Sees the pantry door. You could escape within there. Try to hide. Maybe... Maybe give him the slip. It's a decently large room. You look past him. You could try to just dart out of the kitchen. Back into the dining room. He hasn't really blocked the space yet. Maybe just because he doesn't think you'll do it or 
Maybe he's tempting you too. But that would leave your sister in the cupboard. And you know he's seen her. Matashtai looks to his right. Sees a block of wood. Tiny holes carved into it. Knives setting in each. Reaches out. Grabs a knife. Holds it in front of him. The bandit looks at Matashtai. Grins this toothy, blackened, missing teeth grin. Fronts kind of gestures as if to encourage the Tashtai to come at him. The young Adaran charges. Bandit grabs his wrist, slams it against the counter, shakes the knife from his hand, smacks him across the face, and Matashtai goes reeling backwards. His head swims. His eyes go black for a moment. And that's where we're going to go to break. We'll be back in a few minutes with more Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider leaving a like, commenting, or subscribing. It really helps me out. If you'd like to see me live, head over to my Twitch at twitch.tv forward slash the distant horizon.